We continue to look at Penn State's future opponents here on the BWI Daily Edition, and it's a big one. You know it. It's been circled on your calendar if you're Penn State fans since the beginning of the season. Penn State, Ohio State at uh, Columbus this weekend, 730 and we're bringing in to scout the Ohio State Buckeyes, a pro who's been covering Ohio State for a very long time, Bill Rabinowitz of the Columbus Dispatch. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Happy to be here, Thomas. Thanks for having me on. So the, the Ohio State uh, obviously had uh, the early loss to uh, Oregon in a non-conference game to start the season, but has been rolling ever since. Uh and this week, heading into this particular game, I think we all have a different opinion or feel of what it might have been uh, a couple weeks ago. But what have the Ohio State players and coaches been talking about uh, this week so far about this game this weekend? Yeah, there's still a lot of respect for Penn State by Ohio State. Penn State's played Ohio State tougher than any other team in the Big Ten in recent years. Uh Yes, uh, obviously Ohio State knows that Penn State lost the last two weeks, ugly loss last week, and you know, because they in overtimes to Illinois. But they know that, especially if Sean Clifford's healthy, that the offense can produce points. They, they have a lot of respect for the defense. So, yeah, I know the point spread's gotten a little bit lopsided, but I don't think Ohio State uh, is thinking that way. Now, C.J. Stroud is is a, a central part of Ohio State and their uh, their offense so far this season, as the quarterback always is, but uh, he had an interesting start to the season, and I don't know how loud the calls were, but we did hear them in Happy Valley that some people were unhappy with his play to start the season and that some of them wanted to see a different quarterback. Uh, how has his season gone since that point, and what led into some of those things that came up? Well, you know, there was... I would say minor clamoring. I'm not even sure clamoring okay. is the right word. Maybe minor questions because somebody in the, the back room just expect, going. Hey. Well, look, uh, you know, you get on message boards, and which I tend not to do. <laughs> so I, I, you know, maybe I don't have the pulse on certain aspects of Buckeye Nation because I don't go on those things. But uh, you know, he struggled early a little bit. But look, he threw for 480 yards or so against Oregon. So it wasn't like they lost because of him. We may, he was off on some throws, but he's a first-year starter. Mm -hmm. You expect some growing pains. And so, uh, you know, there was – well, the other thing he was dealing with was a, a sore shoulder. Okay. And that kept him out of the Akron game. They decided to rest him. They figured – well, they knew they could beat Akron with anybody. You know, you or I could have probably led him to, to win that week. But they uh, – so they rested him, and he came back healthier, and he's been lights out ever since. Uh, how have you seen him develop so far this season? Because I think, you know, the last couple of games, especially watching against Indiana, I thought he did some really impressive things. What what have you seen development from him as the guy maybe who was the first time starter at the beginning of the season to now a guy who has uh, half a season under his belt? Yeah, he's always been a confident guy. I mean, quietly self-confident. But early on, he just didn't have the experience. So everything he saw was for the first time. And you, you knew there'd be growing pains, and there were. Um, what I've seen lately is just a willingness to throw the ball wherever he wants. Uh, he made a throw when it was 7-7 to start the, the next Ohio State drive after Indiana scored its only touchdown. He threw a pass over the middle. In fact, I tweeted that to do a DVR review. It's gotten like 100,000 hits or something. Just this pass where he throws it over the middle into triple coverage to Jackson Smith and Jigba. And as he threw it, my beat colleague Joey Kaufman said, he reminded me, said, you know what you said when he – Start to throw that pass, and no, he said, I can't believe he's throwing that. I actually said that out loud in the press box, and then he completed it, and you're like, oh, that's just incredible. Yeah, I covered the NFL for 12 years, and I'm not sure I saw a better pass than that in my time doing that. So, look, I'm not sure it was the smartest play. He had some underneath guys open. I don't think Brian Day wants him making that throw every time. But the fact he had the guts to do it and execute it, kind of tells you where he's playing right now. Yeah, and, and there's some. I, I think there's some early signs as well. Even in the Oregon game, one of the passes that I thought was really impressive is you never see young quarterbacks attack cover two. And uh, Jeremy Ruckert down the seam in the middle of the field, that's some veteran quarterbacks in college football don't make that. So uh, uh, the early signs are there, and it sounds like those are starting to come out more and more and more. Um, is this on the flip side? Is this the most talented receiving core you've seen at Ohio State? Is this the most talented room you've seen from them? I mean, it probably is. Now, they've had some great ones. There was the, the class with Terry McLaurin and Paris Campbell and Johnny Dixon and, and uh, K.J. Hill that was phenomenal. 
uh, they had uh, Austin Mack and Benjamin Victor. I mean, all these guys are NFL guys. And yeah. so, yeah, it's been um, – that, that was impressive. But in terms of the very top, Olave and Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, boy, it's hard to beat that. And Jackson Smith and Jigba is right there with them. And they've got other guys that are coming on, freshmen like Marvin Harrison Jr. from Philadelphia, uh, Emeka Igbuka from uh, the Seattle area. Uh, and they've got tons of guys. I mean, Jameis Williams transferred to Alabama because he couldn't see – I mean, he could see the depth in the room and thought, you yeah, know, I better go somewhere else. And he's having a phenomenal year. But that's what Jameson Williams was thinking in the spring. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is. And when you watch them on film, some of those early passes where uh, CJ Stroud's a little high with the ball, they just vacuum everything in. And it seems like they're they're very in sync at this point of the season. Would you say that that's uh, fair to say that they've gotten more in sync as the season has gone on? Or has that been pretty steady that, throughout? I, it's been pretty steady. But yeah, I think with time comes more comfort. Garrett Wilson dropped an easy pass last week, and I think everyone was like, what? You know, <laughs> he, he's a lot. Wait, he dropped a pass? I mean, it, the expectations for those guys, they're so smooth, and they have such great hands. They run such good routes. Uh, I mean, I almost feel sorry for defenses that try to slow them down. Cause it's, it's almost impossible. And, and it helps that uh... – you know, Stroud has been pressured at one of the lowest rates in the Big Ten so far this season. I think he's like 16th out of 18 quarterbacks, according to PFF, in terms of percentage of, of dropbacks that have been under pressure. Is there any weakness in that offensive line from a pass-blocking perspective? Uh, no, I mean, there isn't. Uh, so it seems like. Uh, N- Nicholas petit Frere is playing at an elite level at left tackle. Dewan Jones, who was the reason that they did the line shuffle, uh, with Petit Frere moving from right to left, and Thayer Munchford, who was an all-league tackle, moving inside to guard, was because well, they, they've just been great. I mean, that pass I mentioned in, over the middle, there was great protection on that play, and that doesn't happen if if Stroud has to even think about, about the pass rush. So, And you've got Trevon Henderson, who <laughs> might just be – you know, a generational talent, that running back. I mean, Ohio State's obviously had great running backs, J.K. Dobbins, Ezekiel Elliott, and I'm not ready to put Henderson in that class yet because let's let him do it a little more. But he did break Archie Griffin's freshman record, and he's only getting eight, nine carries a game because they're blowing out everybody, and so they're not really using him in the second half. But you put all these these weapons together. Jeremy Rucker at the tight end caught two touchdown passes. is a terrific blocker. There's the really no weakness on that on that offense. Yeah, and I wanted to get to Travion Henderson. I think Penn State fans know Master Teague, know what he is as a running back. So you're saying that Henderson is, at least from a talent perspective, on the level of some of the Penn State, uh, or the, some of the running backs that Penn State has seen over the years in a Buckeye uniform. I'm, I'm going to say something that Penn State fans are going to go, what? I think he is potentially a Saquon Barkley talent, but I think he's that good. Oh, now. Barkley obviously was phenomenal, and yeah. Henderson is middle, you know, halfway through his freshman year. Uh, and so, no, I'm not saying that right now Trevon Henderson is Saquon Barkley, but I'm saying he has that kind of talent where, where every time he touches the ball, you go, could this be, you know, could this be the one he breaks? And because he's averaging like nine yards a carry, it's it's just he's got great balance, he's got great speed, power. I mean, he's got everything that you want, and so. Uh, you know, you add that to an offense with the weapons they have, and, and there's there's a reason they're scoring 50 points a game. So one thing it seems like there is on film for Ohio State is that there's there's space everywhere for the offense and, and because you can't leave an area of the field uncovered. They can attack at any point to any point of the field. Uh, first off, I guess, is that a fair assessment? And what do you think is the driving force of that? Is it is it the offensive line being able to run block and Travion Henderson and Master Teague, or is it the pass game that is threatening you know, the boundaries and then deep. What do you think is the primary driver of all of that? I think, I think it's all of it. And I think it's Ryan Day as a play caller. You know, Urban Meyer would always talk about spreading the field horizontally as well as vertically. And, and Ryan Day is the same way. They want to put you in space and figure that Ohio State's athletes are going to be better than your athletes and put pressure on you to tackle them in, in space every time. And, and the other thing is, because of the size of the offensive line, essentially they've got four tackles playing uh, around Luke Whipple in the center. Uh, all those other guys are really tackles naturally. And so if they want to maul you, they'll just do that. If it's third and two and they just need to run behind Petit Frere and Munford, they'll do it. 
So, I mean, the only thing that's, well, they had nobody stopped Ohio State lately. They've had 19 straight touchdowns, uh, well, until the second half uh, against Indiana. 19 straight score touchdowns led by Stroud and, and the starters, which is just an amazing stat. Uh, Penn State has played Ohio State close over the last couple of years, but coming into this game, they've got a, a really tough situation where uh, they are down to some of their last defensive tackles on the depth chart with P.J. Musfer going out, having a thin group to begin with. So I'm going to put you in Brent Pry's shoes. You are the defense coordinator, Penn State. You're tasked with stopping this high-powered offense. Do you put your secondary, which is the strength of the team, on an island, right. all Big Ten candidate Joey Porter, all-American candidate Jaquan Brisker, the rest of that defense in the back seven, you put them on islands with those receivers and stack the box, or do you play coverage and try to just let the chips fall where they may? What is your plan of attack if you're trying to stop this offense? Well, I probably do. I probably put the, the secondary on an island, uh, at least for most of the game, and it all depends on situations. But if that's the strength and you feel like you can rely on them rather than just giving up chunks of yards, I mean, Tulsa, and again, Penn State's a lot better than Tulsa, but Tulsa decided, okay, they were going to uh, shut down the pass or at least limit the pass, and they did. That's when Henderson ran for 277 yards. So I think it's generally easier to run the ball. It's more complicated to throw it. Uh, you got to protect. you got to – I mean, it's just a little tougher if things aren't clicking. Well, they are clicking. So Ohio State, what, what they've done in recent years with Justin Fields and now with C.J. Stroud, the thing that's kind of the most impressive to me is they can seemingly get eight yards anytime they want it, Yeah, 12 yards anytime they want it. They throw the little out pattern to the wide receiver and it's second and two. And to be able to do that is just such a luxury. And then when you figure that all, need, all Henderson needs is a crack and he's gone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're going to, say, pick your poison – and you've got a secondary that's pretty good. Take your chances with the secondary playing the way they can and, and not let Ohio State just go up and down the field with the run. Yeah, and we saw it last year for Penn State where, where they were playing, I thought, decent on the outside, but you got a young guy in Joey Porter Jr., and and I think it was Garrett Wilson on, on a go ball that great coverage, but he just it was in the perfect spot. It was a perfect catch, and and when you have something like that, you you have to play soft coverage, and then anytime you want it, you just cut that off, and you get nine yards on a, on a comeback route. It really is a problem, and I've tried to explain that to Penn State fans of like they're giving them those yards so they don't get something else. Now another thing uh, that I, I'm curious about from your perspective that I haven't uh, been able to peg down is C.J. Stroud is a pocket quarterback from the way he plays. Does he have the, does he have the athleticism to break the pocket and get yards underneath? Or is that really not anything he's interested in doing if he has to? Well, he's more mobile than Dwayne Haskins and much less mobile than Justin Fields. He is closer to Haskins. Okay. But I think he can run. It's just he is a pocket passer. Now, he'll move out of the pocket and make some throws. So it's not like he's a statue back there. But he does not – running is not his preference. He'll run if there's open yardage and they need a first down, and, and that's about it. But he would rather sit back in the pocket. Why wouldn't you when you have a perfect pocket most times? Right. Uh, from the defensive side of the ball, what's the biggest difference in the defense you've seen since Matt Barnes took over as the play caller? Well, they've kind of gone away from the single high safety look, which Oregon really exploited. They were very predictable with that. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'm writing a story about, about Barnes right now. And, and he's really and – it, and everyone says it's a group effort. It's not just Matt Barnes. You know, it's the new king of the defense and, and kind of ruling from on high. And it's a collaborative effort. Larry Johnson, of course, people in Penn State, Penn State know very well. He's integral to that. Um, so, but they are playing more of a – their disguising looks better. They're not being as predictable on defense. And, and that's been a, a major factor in their improvement. And the biggest factor, honestly, is that guys have gotten experience. They were mm -hmm. playing an extremely young back seven at the start of the year. And those guys are now – finding their roles, finding their grooves, and, and they're getting better. Now, it's, the defense is not what Ohio State's offense is. It's still, you know, comparatively the weak link and hasn't really been tested by a great offense. And, and 
with Clifford not being 100%, I'm not sure Penn State is going to test them the way that we thought they would a couple weeks ago. But right. I still think Penn State's offense has more weapons than, than most of their opponents so far, other than Oregon. So I, w- I was actually going to say this for the end, but you bring up a great point. Uh, one of the minor blemishes on a blowout for Ohio State last season at Beaver Stadium was Jahan Dotson going up and, and beating Sean Wade. Is there a guy that you think among those young players that can challenge Dotson because, you know, every every game so far this season, or almost every game, he's just made one of those catches that you just go, okay, that was amazing. Uh, we'll move right, on now. Right. Right. I mean, he's a terrific player. And, you know, I don't know that there's one guy on the defense that Ohio State thinks of as their lockdown corner, like they hope Sean Wade would be last year, or Jeff Okuda, some of these other guys they've had. I, I think all of them, Cam, uh, Cam Brown, Seven Banks, and both those guys have been injured, but they're now healthier. And Denzel Burke, the true freshman, has been just terrific. I mean, all those guys can. Now, I think Dotson's going to make a play or two. I mean, just like you kind of referenced, like, oh, tip your hat. You know, the problem for Penn State is can he make five of them? Can he make eight of them? You know, that's that's yeah. what they may need to do. Um, you know, this is not going to be – I remember the days when it was, what, you know, 63-7? I mean, that's not going to – I'd be shocked if it were like that. Penn State has too much pride. They're too much – too talented, even in, in their with the injuries they've got. I, I don't expect it to be that kind of blowout, but I do think it'll be tough for Penn State, especially if Clifford is not 100%, to be able to kind of match Ohio State's uh, scoring. Yeah, I, I actually tweeted out today, you know, for Penn State fans, just as a reference, Ohio State has three Jahan Dotsons and a Pat Fryer move. So they, they have a significant advantage of, of that. And having one of those other young guys step up is is obviously on, on the scouting report for Penn State. But another big thing for Sean Clifford is having a clean pocket and playing from, you know, a, a sound position mentally and physically. The physical part, it is what it's going to be. But from, from that part of having a clean pocket, what have you seen from the Ohio State defensive line? Is, is there a Bosa or a Young or a player of that caliber up front that is uh that we've seen over the years well you know it's very rare for anybody to have a bosa or, or young but they had so one for think... nine years they, <laughs> they did they did you know zach harrison's probably the closest to it as a defensive end you know he's 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 really talented guy he's gotten better uh you notice him mm-hmm. he's very fast he's, he's just like physical speed a freak when it comes to just his size and speed um hasn't quite had the impact that some people thought he would, but he's he's been very good, and lately he's been better than very good. Haskell Garrett on the inside has just been a force, which we expected. He, he got – I mean, last year, I don't know, Penn State fans remember this, know this. He was actually shot in the face. He was trying to help out. He was this, just a innocent bystander witnessing an altercation last summer, uh, summer of 2020, and tried to intervene and help the woman, and he got shot in the mouth. And – he came back and played, which some people thought, you know, that, that's it. He's not going to ever play again. He came back, played really well, and he's built on that this year. Ohio State's defensive tackles have had more sacks than the defensive ends, mm-hmm. which is kind of kind of surprising. And they've got these two young guys, uh, JT Tool. Tool, I'm going to, I never get his, I even asked him how to pronounce his name, Tua Malolau. Tui Malolau. That's it, Tui Malolau. Even I. What's it? So you know, I've he, noticed with it, it, Polynesian, I think, right? Yes, you've yes. got to get the flow down. I, I've yes. I've I've tried over the years with with guys like that. You got to get once you know the flow, it's it's very melodic. But if you don't have the flow, you don't get the name, and it's tough. Not everyone can have a simple name like Rabinowitz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know he's playing, he's playing very well. Uh, Jack Sawyer, another five star guy whose name I can pronounce, uh, played very well. Uh, Tariq Smith. Tyreek Smith's come back from injury. He's another guy who can give you a pass rush. So they're really, really deep on okay. the defensive line. I mean, that's I know Penn State is they're very envious of that. So they don't have maybe a Chase Young, but they've got a bunch of really good guys. Yeah, and they seem very active in the run game as well. They seem like they've it's maybe yes. uh in the pass game it's not as the same, but the the run game they seem very active and they're very hard to block in that area. And Penn State can't run the ball anyway, so going up against that, I, I'm I don't know if they'll even try, truthfully. Like I, I'm I'm wondering they ran the ball twice against uh Illinois in the third quarter. So I'll be I'll be curious to see how long before they kind of let that go and, and lean on Sean Clifford in the passing game. Uh, that linebacking core has always been solid. 
are there guys there that are difference makers uh and and kind yeah. of who are the leaders there yeah, if you want to find a weak link on the defense, that's probably where it is. Is they, they don't have a guy that you go, well, I mean, it's understandable. Last year you had four guys who had been there forever and just held down the fort for multi multiple years, and those guys are all gone. So you knew you'd have an entirely new linebacker core, and then two guys quit during the season. Two of their seniors quit. You know, Kayvon Pope very memorably in the Acre game had a temper tantrum at the sideline, and that was that was that for, it for him. But they've got some guys that are – you can see them grow. Steel Chambers is actually a converted running back. He's come in and played very well. Um, uh, Cody Simon's a guy that you can see getting better and better. So they've got – you know, it's not, I would say, up to Ohio State standard right now, but it's not the weak link it was early in the year. Uh, Bill Rabinowitz of the Columbus Dispatch with us. We're talking Penn State, Ohio State. He's giving us the information on uh, the Buckeyes who are the heavy favorite in this game coming up this Saturday at 7.30. Just a few more questions. Uh, one of the things I, I want to know, I guess I'm curious about, is uh, the Sean Clifford's health is going to be a major factor in this. Um, do you think, is your of your opinion, do you think that Penn State can score enough points in this game against that Ohio State defense we just talked about? I have my doubts. I mean, I, but I will say this: I, I've gone to Ohio State Penn State games now for eleven years, and several times in those years, I've thought that Ohio State just had too much talent for Penn State, and that it wouldn't be a close game. And it was. Mm -hmm. And so I, I respect Penn State for the they they never are intimidated by Ohio State, which is not something you can say for some Big Ten teams. They they come out and they play like they expect to win, and I don't expect it to be any different on Saturday. So. You know, it's hard for me from an X's nose perspective to go, oh, yeah, Penn State's really got a chance. But I know how these games generally go. And Penn State plays Ohio State tough. Penn State is the one Big Ten program that recruits close to the level that Ohio State does, or at least tries to. And so they have a bunch of talented guys. And if Ohio State's not on their game, if they commit some turnovers, if they're sloppy, yeah, absolutely, Penn State can give them a game. But if all goes the way it looks, I just don't see Penn State beating Ohio State. And one of the things I I, I believe is that uh, both teams are built similarly, and and the problem that James Franklin has right now is his offense isn't explosive enough because they want to be Ohio State, they want to play that way. They're they're built to play with and beat this team, but right now the critical factors that create that are all kind of out of sync. I do think uh, from from a personal perspective that. Because of that, because that Penn State is set up to play Ohio State more so than an Illinois team that they only see once every other or every third year under a new head coach, not to give excuses for what happened to Penn State last week, but this game, not that they circle it, they, they build their team around the idea of winning these particular games. So just from, from my perspective, I, I do think for Penn State fans that... Uh, the, 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 a lot of Penn State fans think this isn't even going to be a, a, a game in the first quarter. So my last question to you is, uh, and as you can see behind me, I'm a Bills fan. This feels, from a Penn State fan perspective, like 2010 Patriots Bills, where they know it's Sunday Night Football. We just want to get through till Tuesday, and everyone can forget that it was 56 to seven, and and that's the vibe you're getting from Penn State fans. So let me ask you this question. Normally, I ask, is this game going to be close in the fourth quarter, like within a touchdown? By the by, the third quarter is Penn State within two touchdowns. Ooh, I'd say it's probably 50-50. I, mean, I had to move the line. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can see it happening. Look, I, I still, like I said, have a lot of respect for Penn State's program. I, I lived in Pennsylvania for 10 years uh, in New York, so I'm familiar with Penn State's history. And so I never count out Penn State. On the other hand, I could see Ohio State doing to Sean Clifford what they did to Jack Tuttle last week and knock him out early because he's not very mobile. The offensive line's shaky. And Penn State may just say, okay, live for another day. Mm -hmm. uh, that that may be the scenario. Uh, you know, I still look at their running backs and go, I remember them. They're pretty good. Now, I can't speak for the offensive line, which obviously has struggled. But, you know, there are a lot of things that if you kind of think intellectually you think with you know yes ohio state should blow penn state out but then you kind of think emotionally and you think about the history and you think about your respect for penn state and you think 
I wouldn't be surprised if this is a closer game than people think. So I'm kind of on the fence with this. You know, I, I can see it being a blowout, and I wouldn't be surprised, and I can see it being a close game, and I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah, I'm with you there. I, I think that's fair. I think that there's more of a chance. I'll put it this way. I think there's more of a chance that Penn State can keep this close and make it a game than there is uh, this overwhelming evidence that's going to be this big blowout. So I do think that that possibility does exist. So I'm glad that we had this conversation, uh, and thank you for coming on the BWI Daily Edition. That's Bill Rabinowitz of the Columbus Dispatch. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Thomas. Appreciate it. That'll do it today for the BWI Daily Edition. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, here on YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, we want to make sure we keep growing the channel and that we're giving you the information you want on Penn State football and, of course, the scouting reports on their opponents. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We'll be back again tomorrow.